This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Thank you very much for that extremely generous introduction. If you've got it written out, I'll give you my mother's address and you can just put it in the mail to her. Um, well, uh, somehow uh, things worked out that we're here on Halloween, so happy Halloween to everybody. I hope I don't scare the devil out of you with what I'm about to say. Um, let me start, you raised my time at Stanford, uh, let me start with that time in the mid-1970s. Uh, I know you uh, remember it well, I think you were coming back just about then, Michelle. Uh, I had just started the PhD program here at Stanford in the mid-1970s and the campus then was seized with the issue of teaching quality after some very popular uh, teachers at Stanford had been denied tenure. And one of the most popular, um, Harry Harding, uh, opted to leave the university even after getting tenure. And there was a general sense that teaching was not adequately valued by the university. The founding of this Center for Teaching and Learning in 1975, and I want to say the gradual expansion of its mission and scope of work under the extremely able leadership of Michel Marinkovich over these many years, I think would prove to be one of the seminal developments uh, in the life of Stanford University in its maturation into a truly great university. It needs to be underscored again and again, I hardly need to do it here, but I'm going to anyway, that no college and university uh, can be great unless it is great at teaching. And this requires a continual ongoing process of, well, you know, training, refreshing, renewing, evaluating, and learning ourselves as teachers, including learning from our students uh, and the feedback they give us about how to become more effective te teachers. Uh, I want to address today the dimensions of teaching that lie outside the classroom and even outside the context of formal instruction. But before I get there, I do want to stress that the core of the educational experience is classroom teaching. I don't want any, you know, uh, misunderstandings about that from the focus of my talk. And therefore, uh, it's vital that we do as good and inspiring a job at that as we possibly can. A couple of years after this center was established, the ASSU appointed a task force on tenure and teaching quality, partly in response to the controversies I'd referred to. I was actually asked to chair that task force, and it included such great Stanford teachers as Donald Kennedy, uh, the late Alan Cox, uh, and Bill Rivers in communication. After studying the issue for most of a year, we came to the conclusion and unanimously recommended to the Faculty Senate uh, that improving the quality of teaching required a comprehensive structure of knowledge and incentives, uh, and that that had to require um, the evaluation systematically of every class um, by students with some kind of standardized uh, course evaluation. And uh, I'm proud to say I think it's one of the few tangible things I can point to in the, over 30 years at this place where I feel like maybe I've really accomplished something. Um, the Faculty Senate did vote to adopt uh, a requirement uh, that every course be evaluated by students every time it's offered. Uh, not long after that, the Dean of Humanities and Sciences established the Dean's Teaching Awards to add to the incentive structure. Now, before I move on to what was the advertised topic of the uh, afternoon, I'd like to say two more things. The first is that if we're going to be as good as we can be at teaching, we have to diffuse information and consciousness about our teaching as widely as possible. And this requires, I really want to underscore this, public access to course evaluations. For me, this is a moral issue as well as a bureaucratic one. When students are paying, do the math, several thousand dollars per course. And when the opportunity uh, costs of taking one course over another are so high, 
they have a right to the information through the vehicle of their own student course guide. And of course we need to work with them to make that guide as effective and responsible in the processing of the information as possible. Second, we still need to do more. I feel quite strongly about this and I don't think the university has had an adequate conversation with itself about this. We still need to do more to reward and retain outstanding teachers. It became clear to me early in the life of this um, uh, ASSU task force on tenure and teaching quality as some of my youthful idealism began to confront uh, reality that a great university like Stanford was never going to award tenure to a great teacher if he or she had a poor record of scholarship and publication. And I now will say I, I think that's the right um, approach. Um, and faculty should always be encouraged to integrate their teaching and research and to make excellence in one drive and inspire excellence in the other. But the fact is that some faculty, when they become tenured, bear unusually large loads of teaching and advising and come to make an unusually large difference in students' educations and their lives inside and outside the classroom. And they may not be as productive in research and scholarship uh, as some of their colleagues, partly as a result of this. I still don't think, in fact, I'm quite certain that we, do, uh, that we don't do enough to reward these truly gifted teachers with, among other things, permanent salary increases beyond just one-time forms of recognition. Okay, enough said. Now, what can we do and do better to teach outside the classroom and thereby make more of a positive difference in students' lives? Uh, I'll discuss this uh, challenge in several aspects, falling into basically the three logical groups. One is purely academic, uh, involving individual uh, instruction through directed reading, but in particular work with students uh, in their honors theses, which has been a very rewarding uh, and enriching experience for me. A second involves bridging academics and the real world by helping students find opportunities to study overseas, to learn through traveling, and to find service learning internships. And the third is more personal. It's advising them on their next steps, their future careers, sometimes just the problems in their lives. Let me say a few uh, general words then that cut across these various forms of engagement with students outside the context of a class and a classroom. First of all, uh, this is teaching at the micro level, the retail level, very time consuming. I'm going to come back to this problem again and again. Students need time individually to be heard to have read what they have written, to be advised, to be engaged and helped and supported. But for most faculty members, um, <laughs> this is a painful thing to confront. Time is a scarce and precious commodity. Part of this involves setting priorities. And part of it involves setting limits on how much we take on, including how many advisees we take on how many students we can realistically engage in this way and give quality time to. Which means we have to be thinking about who else is out there that can um, work with a student uh, in um, a way that can fit very well their interests and ambitions. There's also the need to think about the purpose of the meeting with the student and to leave enough time to address the purpose. I think much of what I'm going to say here is self-evident and so I'm a little embarrassed about it, but anyway, um, maybe it's useful to have a record of it. If the meeting is to update progress on the honors thesis and hand back a chapter that needs only minor revisions, well maybe that can be accomplished in 20 minutes. But if hard thinking is needed about the structure and scope of a project, as big as an honors thesis or about where the student is headed in life, then it's going to take a lot more time. It may need an hour or more. And you can't just have this formula where 
you've got 15, 20, 30 minute even blocks of time and that's what students are offered. I know that there is nothing more discouraging for a student than finally getting to see a professor about something important that they want to talk about and then they're realizing that the meeting is under the tyranny of a rapidly ticking clock. Which means also that we need to find ways to engage students outside of the rigid format, you know, heavily parceled out of office hours. Which is why I like to get in the dorms and, you know, talk to the students there, have a meal with them or whatever. Uh, so the obvious point, some meetings with students about some issues can be accomplished in 15 or 20 minutes. Some need a lot more time. The most important thing I can say about engaging students outside the classroom is that it's not about us as professors or teaching assistants. It's about them. There are times when students come to office hours because they want to hear about what the professor thinks. They want to get to know the professor better, know what she or he does for a living outside the classroom. But the first key to being a good advisor is to be a good listener. A good listener has to be focused, patient, and when necessary, probing. Being focused means giving the student all of your attention. Phone calls should be taken very sparingly at most. Interruptions obviously should be minimized. I mean, you know, if the phone is ringing constantly, you're kind of got one eye on the email while the other's on the student in front of you. They, they pick up these obvious uh, signals about priorities. The student in front of you needs and deserves your complete attention. And they need to be given a chance to say what is on their minds, what they're excited about, what they're struggling with. Um, so there needs to be a kind of open and supportive atmosphere. This requires patience on the part of the listener, but also a readiness to probe and stimulate the conversation. One of the most common types of conversations I have with students comes when they start thinking of what they're going to do after they graduate. The possibilities seem bewildering and daunting. In fact, they can be paralyzing because there are so many possibilities. Students are often very confused and at the initial stages not very well informed, not only about what the implications are of the various possibilities they might be thinking, but not very well informed of what's really their hierarchy of preferences. Do they want to go to graduate school for a PhD, an, M an MA, an MBA, a law degree? Should they do some kind of service first, which I'm a bit a big advocate of, but it's not for everyone? Should they work? Should they travel? For how long? Where? They want our advice. But a good advisor needs to be cautious and to bear in mind, I'm going to say it again, it's not about us, it's about them. The challenge is not to turn the student before us into an image of ourselves. Not every student has to become a professor. Not every political science PhD uh, candidate has to wind up teaching in a university and publishing in the academic journals. Um, we have to think about what is their passion, their gift, um, you know, what is their niche. Um, and uh, help them to discover it and explore it, draw it out of them, put forth a range of possibilities that might help stimulate it. Uh, in advising, I rarely say, you should do X. Rather, it's better and more appropriate to say, here are your options. You could go to graduate school right away, but you know, are you burned out with studying? Is that what you really want to do? Is there some reason why you need to be in a hurry that way? Do you feel you need some time off? What about service, the Peace Corps, Teach for America, some other way of giving back to a community for a time while learning in a different way from direct engagement with people? What about the opportunities? I hope they're going to grow for postgraduate fellowships uh, at uh, the Haas Center, through the Haas Center, like the Gardner Fellowship. What about working in government for a year, a civic organization, a consulting firm? All of these have different implications, fit the profiles, uh, needs, possibilities of students in, in different ways. 
The best way to advise is to get the student to see the range of possibilities and the possible consequences and implications of each option for their own personal and professional growth. They have to be the one to decide, and they have to be excited about the course they're embarked on. The two most important questions I can ask when advising a student are, first of all, what are you excited about? What do you care about in life? And second, where do you want to be in 10 or 20 years? What can you envision yourself doing in terms of a job or a career that you would be happy about and excited about and find fulfilling and not just something that is a path that was laid out by your parents or something that seems necessary in order to validate your spending you know, close to $200,000 on a Stanford education if you've had to pay the full ride. If a student can work forward from the basic question of what excites and inspires them and backward from the question of where they'd like to be and what they'd like to be doing at the age of 40, then an advisor can better help them to understand the range of possibilities. The problem is that some students really don't have any idea of how to answer uh, that question of where they want to be in 20 years. And that requires working forward from the first question. What excites them and appeals to them? What do they love doing and engaging? What subjects have turned them on here at Stanford? I don't have any magical solutions to this problem except patience and persistence. Often, this is the type of con conversation that has to unfold over multiple meetings as students are turning things over in their mind, weighing possibilities, beginning to think about it, interact with their peers, interact with the various um, programs and opportunities and fairs that we have, career fairs and so on here uh, at Stanford. I have them you know, talk to different uh, uh, pe people if they're thinking about a career in the Foreign Service, well, we have former diplomats on campus. Let them sit down and uh, talk to people um, who've had that kind of career and think about whether it's really for them. Um, then there are the students who can answer the question of where they want to be in 10 or 20 years, perhaps too precisely and too <laughs> ambitiously. Sometimes there is value in encouraging students to take some time and not be in so much of a hurry. That they don't have to be, and this is the most difficult thing to say, probably won't be the youngest this or that in American history. And that they will wind up being better at what they do if they come to it, you know, not in a straight laser path, but from a diversity of life experiences. And then there are the students who are clearly ready for the next step, and pretty much all that's necessary is to write them the letter of recommendation they deserve. So let me say something about one of my favorite activities in life, writing letters of recommendation. Um, part of teaching outside the classroom is helping students get the fellowships, the internships, the overseas studies opportunities, the graduate school admissions, and the jobs that they want. This means writing letters of recommendation, and probably lots of them over a long period of time. Every professor finds his or her own method for managing this very solemn responsibility. I'll say a few things about what I've learned from the process of, after many years of having asked for recommendations, written recommendations, and read and evaluated letters of recommendation. I think much of this is obvious, but um, if you haven't started yet through the process, which will then become a lifelong process of writing letters of recommendation, I'll share with you a bit of what I've learned. A really good letter of recommendation has to say more than that the student got a grade of A in the class, wrote very smart, you know, uh, perceptive essays, and spoke often and intelligently in the classroom. Um, it's got to go beyond that. It should give the reader a sense of the student as a person and of what she or he might become beyond what can be grasped from the transcript and even from the student's own statement of purpose. By the way, one of the things I've learned uh, for many of these fellowships 
is that the student is strictly limited uh, in terms of the number of words. And even in response to some of the uh, questions posed, for example, on the Truman Scholarship application, the number of characters in the response they can give to different questions in their, in essence, statement of purpose, sometimes split into different pieces. Very often, the faculty recommender has no such limits. Um, so we have much more freedom to uh, give the full picture of the student. Being able to do so requires a lengthy conversation, typically, I'd say, maybe more than one, to inform the recommender. What has the student done outside the classroom and in other classrooms that drives her or him to want this fellowship, study opportunity, grant, job, academic program? How does it relate to her broader programs of study or her longer-term career aspirations? What is special, special and memorable about the student as a person? You know, I had a student who was a competitive diver. Well, I found that interesting to put in the letter of recommendation. It gives you um, a, a window onto the person. I, I have a student who climbs in his spare time, you know, and has gone up the sheer face of Capitan twice at Yosemite. My palms start sweating when I even say the sentence that I just said. <laughs> but, you know, he does it. And I don't know, if, if, first of all, if I were reading a letter of recommendation and, and found this about this, you know, very bookish, academic, well-performing student that, oh, by the way, he does triathlons and um, he's climbed uh, Capitan a couple of times. I'm not going to forget it. I can tell you that. And it tells you something about the student's kind of discipline and resolve. Or it might be um, working in a community program uh, with um, uh, you know, youth in East Palo Alto, or uh, this very wonderful program that I found that some of my students have uh, worked in Abla La Noche that works with the, um, uh, the staff here. Uh, uh, in the university, um, the lower level blue collar staff helping those whose native language is Spanish to learn English better. And I mean, all of these give a more rounded picture of the student as a person that even if you don't think it's going to help them get the fellowship or job or whatever, it might because it helps to make them stand out and enrich the portrait of who is applying. I'll say also uh, that often um, the recommender can toot the horn, sing the praises, and give the full positive profile of the student who's applying for this or that a lot better than the student can. If they say it, it looks you know, awfully kind of unhumble and self-promotional. But if we say it, um, you know, we're just being honest. And then, in fact, in fact if they understate things a, a bit, then they look kind of humble, so you've got the kind of good cop, silent cop um, uh, combination that um, can be a very powerful one. So when I uh, agree to write a letter of recommendation for a student, um, I want to see everything. I want to see the description of the job or fellowship they are applying for. I want their statement of purpose and anything else they've submitted. If I can get it beforehand and give them some comments on it, even better. I want to see their academic transcript because I want to know even if they've been in my class, how did they do in other classes? And how does uh, their performance in my class relate to others? I want to see their resume and I want to ask them about things on their resume I didn't know about. Then I want to meet with the student and know what lies behind the things they did on the resume. Again, what is their passion? What is their ambition? What is the link between what they are applying for and what they want to do 5, 10, 20 years down the road? Letters are, of recommendation are often one of the most important items in a file of application. Um, often more important uh, than grades and test scores and so on because they can give a sense of the student's personal qualities that cannot otherwise be grasped. And because a faculty or staff recommender, I again say, has more scope to convey some of the positive qualities and capacities of the student than the student may be able to do for reasons of space or reasons of you know, awkwardness and humility in the statement of purpose. So um, 
it's very important to really have um, these bases of information, some of them garnered through, you know, sustained interaction with the student. Now let me talk a bit about honors thesis uh, advising. I have found this to be, I say again, one of the meaning, most meaningful and rewarding forms of teaching at the undergraduate level, in part because you know, here are these people doing original research on subjects related to my research. Uh, you know, I just finished a book on democracy and I wound up citing one of these um, honors theses because he had found some things about what's going on in Egypt that actually none of the other literature I had, um, at least um, uh, up to this moment, had, um, had discovered quite so precisely. In the programs I work with in international relations, political science, and our recently formed Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at the Freeman Spogli Institute, we have developed, I think, pretty good, not perfect, but hopefully getting better, seminars for helping honor students to develop their thesis proposals and then structure, write, and present their theses. These seminars where students learn what is involved intellectually and logistically in preparing and executing a major original research project, what is involved in terms of the ethical issues in doing serious social science research, and in particular in terms of interviewing people and asking them to give potentially uh, sensitive uh, information, uh, sometimes politically dangerous information. These seminars are indispensable uh, in shaping responsible and high quality research prod products. I think at any level, but particularly since for most of the undergraduates this is the first time they're doing anything on that scale, these uh, juniors and then seniors typically writing the honors theses. However, the seminars are no substitute for close individual supervision and active engagement by a faculty advisor. The advising process has to begin at the beginning with motivation. I try to make clear to the student that the thesis is a major undertaking, the writing of which will consume much of their senior year, and they need to have a strong personal and intellectual commitment, as well as adequate time to see it through. I try to make sure it's something they really want to do and are excited about, rather than something they, need, they feel they need to do in order to graduate with, quote, honors, to check another box. Sometimes I discovered that the student wants to have the experience of writing an extended original research paper, but either doesn't have the time or the will to do something on the scale of an honors thesis, or doesn't have the grade point average to qualify for honors. In these circumstances, there are other options. The student can write a very good and meaningful research paper on a more limited scale say over the course of a quarter or even two rather than three. I've been happy to work with students and give them credit for independent research in this way. Not every really exciting and original research project has to rise to the scale of an honors thesis. And there's no reason why, by the way, I'd like to add this point, a student who you know, didn't get the 3.5 grade point average in the major and therefore doesn't qualify for honors can't do original research and write even what amounts to an honors thesis. The key is that it has to be something they are doing because they care about it. They're turned on by the subject, not because they, quote, need to do it. Once a student is committed to and excited about a topic, they need a research plan. For my students, this generally involves going abroad to do research, usually in the summer after the junior year but sometimes even beginning with research or internships uh, abroad the previous summer. So planning ahead is essential, and I have found with students who are really highly focused and quite likely to have the academic achievement and the intellectual ambition to write an honors thesis, uh, the earlier they can start at least thinking about it, the better, more creative, more multidimensional um, their uh, research plan can be. For an IR student who wants to do a thesis on a foreign country or international problem, planning needs to begin, I think, ideally by early in the junior year at the latest. 
because the student needs to do a fair amount of preparatory research, background reading to scope out the problem, structure a research question, and then prepare a grant proposal so they can get funding from the undergraduate research program to do the overseas research. Um, but again, if they can start thinking about it in their sophomore year, they may first be able to have a Chapaluji grant or a, a SIG in internship or some other kind of fellowship, volunteers in Asia for the summer, if it's Asia, that might introduce them to a region and at least begin to get them into it. Then we need to think about how the interviews are going to be done and materials collected. What are the techniques and, again, the ethics of interviewing people, particularly on sensitive subjects? We've made a very big effort uh, in our uh, honors research prep seminar at CGDRL to give students practical experience in doing this interviewing and to confront some of the uh, emotional as well as political sensitivities of uh, asking questions. You know, if you're dealing with women in a refugee camp uh, in Goma uh, who uh, have been, uh, or near Goma, across the border in Zambia, you know, who've been raped uh, as a result of a systematic technique of, of war and warlordism, uh, you've got to approach this in a very mindful, delicate, and sensitive way. Uh, you've got to, you know, really be sensitive and, um, and tread carefully. How can students then gather information and learn in a way that does not endanger people or intrude unduly on their privacy and time? What can these students who are doing this research give back in return? Uh, there are things they can do at the time, impart service uh, while they're there. And uh, there are things they can do afterwards, impart by sharing in a variety of ways the research that they've done. When the student returns, the initial task is to take stock of the research over the summer. Has the problem changed in some way as a result of the research? What will be the plan for distilling the interview material and other information collected? Is there any way of coding this information statistically that would be, I underscore this word, meaningful? Uh, I encourage students to go through uh, their interview material, to go through the qualitative data they've uh, uh, gathered, and think about whether there's some way of aggregating it statistically that would make sense, that would add value. But to have a, a profusion of tables and figures or even regressions, simply again to check a box, I think propels a student down a wrong uh, methodological and intellectual path. What new reading, theoretically and comparatively, about the case, about the problem, about the larger issues, does the student need to do now as a result of the problem having mutated and evolved in the field? Then there needs to be a timetable for writing. I always ask my students to walk back from the due date. Again, this seems so self-evident that I probably don't need to say it. Everyone wants in print principle, everyone at Stanford who do, does one of these things, to be considered for a thesis award. So the due date usually has to be walked back from uh, the due date of early, you know, to not so late in May. They need to allow time for slippage, things they can't anticipate. It may take longer to get through a body of data and write a particular chapter than they could have imagined. Uh, another class that they have to take may take more time than they could have imagined. And, you know, in the words of a uh, recently appointed uh, colleague of mine uh, at uh, the Hoover Institution, stuff happens. Uh, people might get sick. They might have a family tragedy. You have to leave time to anticipate these things. So I have them draw up an outline of the thesis, their chapter structure, sectional structure within the chapters, and then a timetable for completing each chapter that allows for some slippage due to unforeseen circumstances. And then I find, well, this is the ideal. You know, we have to keep reviewing that timetable. Uh, and once they turn in a chapter, I have a look about, you know, how well it matches the timetable they envision and whether they might have to, frankly, uh, you know, spend a little time over Christmas vacation working on the thesis because they're already behind schedule. 
In this way, the thesis becomes not just a long paper, but a valuable exercise in personal discipline, in learning how to manage time and create something substantial. I also go over the writing with the student carefully. The thesis should be more than an intellectual or research exercise. It should also be a process of learning to write more cogently, succinctly, and engagingly. I encourage the student to begin the thesis with a story or some powerful example or narrative that draws the reader in. You know, to begin with an abstract problem and, you know, this body of literature says this, this body of literature says that, that's not the sort of thing that their mother and father or their next door uh, neighbor in the dorm is going to want to read. But if they're going to spend all this time writing this thesis, people who are not specialists in the subject should want to read it and find it fun and engaging to read. I mark up their chapters and encourage them to pay attention to their writing style and how it can be clear, you know, um, more colorful, um, less verbose, as well as the substance of what they are conveying. And I encourage them to think about publishing some version of it at some point. We have an increasing number of outlets for student publishing. And occasionally, you know, this stuff is good enough to be published in academic journals or even in a book, which is what Jared Cohen did with his senior's honors thesis on why the United States didn't intervene in the Rwandan genocide. Finally, I don't think there's any harm in planning the idea for a senior honors thesis early in the mind of a student who clearly has the gift and ambition to do something original and outstanding. My experience has been, I repeat, that the earlier a student starts thinking about such a major project in their career at Stanford, the better they pr prospect they have of weaving together various academic and summer activities so they build into something very unique and integrative. It doesn't have to always be that way, but sometimes uh, you can really have different aspects of their, their life and work accumulate in, in a very powerful way. Sometimes a summer internship or overseas studies opportunity one year can provide the initial introduction to a country or problem that can generate a research grant proposal for the following summer. So students should be uh, encouraged to think about these linkages. Now a few words about internships and fellowships. Um, I'm convinced uh, that one of the most important ways our students can learn outside the classroom, uh, this is not going to surprise Suzanne Abel sitting right in front of me, is through public service. And I have a great admiration for the work of the Haas Center through its various community and public service um, fellowships and through the Stanford in government program locally at the state level, nationally, internationally, and the whole concept of service learning. There are many more students who would like fellowships, and I think particularly internationally, than we can provide now, and I hope we can expand the range of offerings, and I actually, it's one of my passions is to work on that. I try to make students aware of these fellowship and internship opportunities and to look for new ones. There have been students who, you know, apply for these fellowships, don't get them. If you apply as a freshman, sometimes even as a sophomore, and you're, you know, very compelling, but, you know, there's someone else who's equally compelling and it's going to be their last, last shot at it. Well, I've been on these committees. It's a very painful decision. It's hard to choose the freshman, quite honestly, but the really good freshman can find, and, and I've advised ones who have, other ways of getting to Africa or getting to the area or the, the, you know, the arena of work that they want to be in. And often they do. It may require working uh, in some other job for part of the summer. It may require knocking on the door of an uh, unlikely institution, but sometimes they answer the knock and provide support. Helping often means making connections putting students in touch with new possibilities, introducing them to the wealth of foreign visitors and fellows here. You know, once someone has spent a quarter or an academic year at Stanford coming from another country, they have a stake in us. Uh, they care about us. They'll answer our emails, and, may, and they know our students. They've met them, and they know how useful um, they can be. Again, I want to start... Um, uh, by asking the student, what does she care about? What is her passion or her fascination? How can she extend and push herself and make her study 
or work abroad in one of these fellowships speak to her values, her academic goals, and her longer-term aspirations? What might be the connection between the research or internship she might do during the summer and that path stretching out over the next 10 or 20 years? Now, I know I want to leave time for questions and discussions, so let me uh, come to one more theme, which is dealing with and caring about the student as an individual, um, not as a student necessarily in an academic uh, setting. Uh, much of the advising and assistance I offer is, frankly, at a pretty heady level of possibility and, you know, addresses a lot of very exciting, tantalizing prospects. But sometimes the challenge students confront is just getting through the day, the week, the quarter. My friend Tom R Friedman in a column recently called these students Generation Q, quietly going about the challenge of changing the world and building their careers in individual and incremental ways. I think there's truth in that. We can ponder that. There's a good discussion in that. But I have another term for these students, generation stressed. We have to come to grips with this problem of stress, pervasive stress, better than we've been doing. The competition to get into Stanford and then to excel while here is more intense than it has ever been in the 38 years that I have mainly been associated with this university. There are more demands, higher expectations, more stress on students coming into Stanford and getting through Stanford than I've seen in any previous generation I've known. We have to be alert to this, to the signs of excessive stress, discouragement, and depression, and other psychological ma maladies that are treatable but can become quite debilitating, and I will say life-threatening without early recognition and intervention. Why has a student stopped coming to class? Why has she not turned in her paper or exam? Why is he falling asleep in class? The answer could be, <laughs> I know it often was when I was an undergraduate here, they were just partying too hard or not committed enough to their studies. But in this day and age, it is often likely to be serious depression or sleep deprivation from overcommitment. A good teacher has to be proactive here. We have to find out why the student is not performing. And the quarter is short. So we can't wait several weeks to figure out why someone has disappeared from the radar screen. Faculty need to take the initiative to alert and interact with resident staff, the dean of students' office, the registrar's office, other areas of the university to develop a team approach and a sympathetic and supportive set of options for a student who is having serious difficulty. We need to educate ourselves to the opportunities available for counseling at the Vaden Health Center, peer counseling at the bridge, other forms of support. I find it useful to ask students who seem to be having trouble what's going on with their life and to give them the opportunity to unload if they are ready to do so and even to ask for help or to explain that they're getting help and to ask for an incomplete or other arrangement uh, that will, you know, avoid just, I think, an unfair, you know, F at the end of the quarter. I never want to encourage tardiness or procrastination. But the fact is, again, <laughs> the quarter system is brutally short. The pace of life, more than before at Stanford, can be crushing. And we need to give students having trouble a chance to breathe, to recover, to re-equilibrate without fear of failing. We need to convey that this is not abnormal. I know statistically for a fact that it's not. That lots of people are in a similar situation and that there is nothing that is more important than their physical and psychological health and well-being. And I would like to say it again. There is nothing that is more important than the physical and psychological health and well-being of our students. Grades pale in comparison, but since grades are a major source of stress, 
we should try not to hold them hostage to a crisis in a student's life. This leads me to conclude on a mundane subject, which I've become quite passionate about, sleep. My biggest concern about our students uh, is that they are not getting enough sleep. And I know this is a big reason why they struggle a lot through the quarter, physically and psychologically. We all need to do more to emphasize the importance of this and to keep our expectations, and I would add our work assignments, I don't think I do this very well, in line with reasonable expectations. I ask students to consider whether they aren't taking on too much, whether they really want to and can handle 20 units, whether they need to be in such a hurry. I occasionally have to tell a student that it's okay to just take 15 units and set aside some time to enjoy life, something I could not have imagined having to advise a student to do 30 years ago. The problem, unfortunately, is not just one for the students. It is one that I struggle with myself and for which I've not found a good answer. It is a deeply structural problem, and I can reduce it to this example. Making a difference in students' lives is time-consuming. They need time to be heard, time to receive counsel, time to have their papers and emails read, time to write them letters, uh, to search for new opportunities that fit their needs and aspirations, time to engage them and to get to know them as people. But one can only devote so much time to doing all this without losing time from writing, from policy work, from classroom teaching, and from all the other things that you know, one has to do in life, uh, and the things that make students want to engage the professor in the first place. What is often sacrificed first for professors as well as students is sleep. I think there is no absolute solution to this problem. We strive for excellence, strive to give and to be of service, but must come to understand that sustaining this for the long run means striking a reasonable balance between competing demands and involving as many colleagues and peers as possible in work with a given student so that teaching outside the classroom becomes the collective enterprise, the cooperative effort, the conscious ongoing ende endeavor that distinguishes a great university or college from a merely good one. Thank you. Well, I think that um, the one thing I probably haven't done is leave enough time for discussion, but we have some, so any questions, comments, I will more than welcome them. some people in this room who know me well enough to know that you do not want the answer from me. Um, I have an advantage that a number of faculty don't have. You have uh, identified it, and that is I have no obligation to teach. So I teach one course a year. Uh, I, I, I couldn't, I, there's no way I could do all the other things I'm doing uh, if I were teaching four courses a year. Um, I would have to give up a lot of my other activities or basically stop writing or, or something. Um, I, I will say this. Um, more and more as time has gone on and more students have come to me partly because of uh, accidents of history like being sent to Iraq, um, I... Uh, have found it necessary and appropriate to just, you know, really have a close eye on what faculty colleagues are doing work, research, and teaching that would also uh, engage these students so that we can, you know, share the involvements, disperse them, uh, and have this kind of team approach. And. Um, I set uh, a rule for myself that I wouldn't have more than four senior honors theses in one year. Maybe that's too many. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just think you, you have to draw limits. Um, and uh, then uh, I once had to tell a student uh, fairly recently, because I want to hear from them. Um, I want to know what they're doing, but I, I had to tell them I just couldn't read a three-page single-spaced email uh, once every week while he was abroad. Uh, and um, you know what? He understood. Yes? How was the decision made to take down course evaluations and why? To take them down? Yeah, so they're not available to students anymore. I have no idea when, when, Michelle, do you know the answer yeah, to this? Actually, the provost just did direct that the evaluation should become public, so they are available to students. Yeah, they have been down for a while. When the change was made to online evaluations, because there were so many changes and complications involved with changing to an online system, they did take down the public feature for a while. It, it also coincided with some problems at ASSU in organizing the student course guide. But it uh, resumed this quarter at the beginning of this academic year. And there is a commitment going forward that these will be available to students easily online. Do you guys know how to get on them? OK, can you tell us, some of the students here how they get oh. those? Right. Jeremy, do you? Uh, I think it's through access. So the way to do it is through access. Um, because none of these, I mean, none of my students know oh. how to, how to yeah, do that not, because it's been bad. It's not widely known, but it's through, if, you, if you go into access, where you would search for classes, there's another thing that says course evaluations, and you can search there. It does feel almost intentionally obfuscated as a student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ideal mm -hmm. arrangement would be whatever may exist in that vein to also simply give all the data, the ASSU course guide, uh, and let them present it in their own online version, and as they used to do if they wish in a published version as well, that Maybe that isn't necessary now. But also, I think that the ASSU course guide used to give, uh, I think, a fairly um, effective and responsible distillation of written comments. Mm. And um, it's very important, I think, uh, that uh, we not simply rely on the statistical data. The statistical data uh, can hide a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, you want to know uh, what students are saying qualitatively as well. And then there has to be responsibility in fairly representing them and in throwing out, you know, some of the most extreme statements in each direction. Um, so I just favor full access, full transparency, and, and uh, work with the ASSU course guide um, to really have them do a quality job of making this readily available and um, easily interpretable to the student body. I, I should clarify that currently only the quantitative data are available and there are discussions about what to do regarding the qualitative because one happy result of the evaluations going online is that students are actually responding more mm -hmm. in the qualitative boxes. So there is much more feedback, but trying to distill all of that responsibly is still being debated. So thank everybody for bringing that up and I will give some of this feedback to the registrar's office and perhaps contact ASSU about this. I think it'd be good if there were some kind of, you know, a faculty, student, staff, advisory committee to the course guide that could help think about how to do this uh, and just be an advisory body. Um, you know, I will say, uh, having been uh, a student here and a student government person here, that you know, one of the problems is the turnover among students. It's a constant struggle. And so having some institutional mechanism with a little more continuity to give support and advice, I think, could be useful. That's a great idea. Yes? 
You brought up the need to formalize rewarding teaching as a part of the tenure process, and that's a very dominant conversation um, across many institutions, certainly research one. What do you see as being the primary obstacles, and what are your strategies for trying to move it beyond a conversational level to actually making an impact? I think that this university and any university that you know is competing to be a top 10, top 20 university is not going to um, tenure a, a faculty member who has not done some reasonably you know, excellent level of uh, research and scholarship published somewhere. That's just... Uh, a fact that I think is unalterable. Now, once you uh, acknowledge that, um, what else can be done? Number one, um, I uh, think, and some of this, by the way, has been done over the years. Uh, our task force, I think, might have stimulated it a little bit, but um, other things have helped as well, including just, you know, elementary logic. Uh, there needs to be um, more time for uh, leave for uh, untenured faculty. So, um, you know, you can have more space to um, be a really good and giving teacher as an assistant professor if you know that somewhere in the middle you're going to get a year off or even two to just be away from it all uh, and write and do research and perform on that basis. Uh, it's very difficult to juggle all this, you know, in real time simultaneously. It's just hard. And particularly if you've got four courses you have to teach, so there's a quarter where there's going to be two courses that you have to teach. Uh, and a lot of faculty do two and two, and some do two, two, and one. Um, then, you know, how much are you really going to be able to, to, to write uh, and do research when the students are coming to your office hours, they need letters of recommendation, all of the things I've talked about if you're going to take this seriously beyond the classroom teaching. So this suggests, um, and I think the university has been responsive to this need, and then if young faculty have kids or they, you know, they have a new baby come into the house or something, the need is even more pressing for very, very substantial and generous leave time policies. Uh, that's one thing. Obviously, we need to work with young faculty to give them support in terms of learning how to teach well and better, but they do bring enthusiasm into the classroom. They do bring, by virtue of their youth and their having been a student more recently than some of us, uh, an ability to connect that's special. So they've got certain assets that older faculty um, separated by a vaster distance from their uh, student experience don't have. Um, and so uh, I think that um, these are some of the things that we can do. And then if we've got uh, the uh, data uh, to support an evaluation that the candidate has been an outstanding teacher, you know, that sometimes these are close decisions. Uh, deans should use that um, uh, evidence to tip the balance in a certain way. What, what recommendations would you give to students to elicit the kind of attention and care and teaching that you just described? Um, that's a very good question. I would say... Um, uh, First of all, uh, to, obviously to show an, an interest in, in the subject uh, and to um, uh, do well at it and if they're taking the class, for example. Uh, but, you know, in terms of outside the classroom, um, you know, you've got to be respectful of the constraints and, and um, limits of the professors. So, uh, uh, when you go into the office hours um, to be organized and prepared, clear about what you want to talk about, you know, and even to say, you know, look, I have several things I'd like to talk to you about. Um, I'd like to talk to you about this 
paper that I have to write for the class, but I'm starting to think about a fellowship as well, and then I'm really actually already starting to think about graduate school. So um, I don't know how much time you have. I realize we may not get to all of this today, but you know, let's start, if we can, on what's most important, and then maybe if we don't, you know, I could make another appointment with you, that sort of thing. So that immediately uh, tells the professor the student is organized, they have an idea of what they want to talk about, what they need, and um, they're respectful of the fact that the professor or staff member doesn't have an infinite amount of time at any particular moment, uh, and they're willing to engage it sequentially over time. So, I mean, that kind of approach, I think, can elicit. Uh, whereas if a student just goes on and on, meanders, seems insensitive to the constraints at the other end of the desk, you know, that can lead a professor to become, uh, to disconnect a bit. Okay, thank you very much. tyranny of time oh. <laughs> as now, uh, but what a wonderful talk and thank you. So the preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.